Welcome to the Heal Your Hunger Show, where we get to the heart of why you overeat and how to stop. If you struggle with food and weight like I did, welcome home. Welcome, everybody, to the Heal Your Hunger Show. So happy to have you here. It is a great day to be alive, and I am super psyched for this interview because it's going to help you sleep better, and that's going to help you eat better. <laughs> so before I jump into my awesome guest, I want to just say if you're here at the Heal Your Hunger Show for the first time, uh, you haven't heard me say this before, and that is welcome. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. This is where we talk about things that aren't the typical conversation around emotional eating, you know, the emotions, the stressors, the things that lead us to eat. Okay. So you may know a lot about nutrition and diet, but that's not the end of the story. Why you're not falling through on what you know, that's what we need to talk about. So one of them is sleep. So that's why I'm excited about my guest today. And I'm really glad you're here because there's lots of episodes I hope you'll go back and dig into that can certainly help you on your healing journey of overcoming emotional eating. And if you're not sure if you're an emotional eater, uh, guess what? You can take a quiz on my website, healyourhunger.com. Take a free quiz and find out if you're an emotional eater. And not only that, find out if you're an emotional eater or possibly even a food addict and where you are on that spectrum. Because it's actually a spectrum, and I call it the emotional eating spectrum. Find out where you are on that spectrum by taking the quiz and getting a personalized score. Because what you want to do next is going to be based on that score. So get that score, go to healyourhunger.com, take the quiz, and yeah, and we can go from there. But it's a great place to start on your healing journey. Also, we do a lot in the secret sauce group. So go to Facebook. It's a free, a private, but free group on Facebook. It's called the secret sauce to end emotional eating. Definitely check that out. And you'll see lots of different, you know, memes, inspirational messages. I do my social, like my Instagram feed. I post some of those cute things there as well. And I am on Instagram as well. So Trisha Nelson underscore, you can check out my very active Instagram feed at Trisha Nelson underscore. Okay. That's it for that. I'm really psyched to bring you my guest, Dr. Catherine Darley. She's a leader in natural sleep medicine. She combines her knowledge of sleep and circadian disorders with her training as a naturopathic physician to bridge these two fields. She's treated patients for over 20 years, along with training healthcare providers in sleep medicine. Dr. Darley now focuses on teaching people the sleep skills they need to thrive at home, at work, and have a high quality of life. And I love this interview. I learned a lot, and I know you will as well. Okay. Welcome, Catherine. So glad to have you here. Great. Glad to be here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm excited about this conversation. And I have to just say for those listening that we are recording this on the 4th of July because we're passionate about our work and it comes first. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and yeah. And so, and we'll party later, but for now we're, we're carving out this time because we know how important it is to get this message out to you. So yay us, right? Boop, boop. <laughs> so Catherine, I want to talk about sleep, which is your specialty. And it's so important for my audience because we often don't get enough sleep. We often don't prioritize sleep, you know, and I certainly feel like sleep is something that gets used almost as a self-harming thing, lack of sleep that is, you know, and it's for somebody who doesn't always take care of themselves food-wise, you know, sleep is up there as one of the other ways we don't take care of ourselves. And I do think that the better we feel about ourselves, the better our self-care is all the way around. So I'm just prefacing with that and for my audience, because it's a problem oftentimes. And of course, not getting enough sleep can definitely lead to overeating. It's so much harder to make sane and sound choices when we're tired and cranky. So anyway, but let's jump in and love to hear what you have to say about sleep and hunger, because I know you have some thoughts on that. Yeah. So one of the things that people may not know is that when we're sleep deprived, which is about, it's over a third of people who are typically not getting enough sleep. When we're sleep deprived, it actually changes our hormones. So we feel more hungry and it also changes our food choices. So typically when a person is 
chronically sleep deprived, which means they're not getting enough, but they are getting some sleep every night, they typically will eat about 300 calories more a day and will choose more high sugar, high fat, processed foods, and turn away from the vegetables, the lean proteins, and the healthier choices. And, you know, so much of food struggles can be related to, or you feel like it's a discipline problem or a motivation problem. And I really would like people to understand that it actually changes your physiology when you're not getting adequate sleep. So you are going to feel more hungry. It also changes, unfortunately, our blood sugar control and how uh, sensitive our cells are to insulin. So if we're sleep deprived, it's going to lead more towards metabolic dysfunction, which I know is such an issue for so many people as the population ages and people who are struggling with food choices. So that's also another piece to think about. Totally. Thank you for just like hitting us between the eyes on that one. <laughs> so, so, so important right? Sleep can be an aid to healthy eating. Like it's integral to making healthy choices. And it's true. I mean, I, that makes so much sense to me. You know, when I'm tired, I want, you know, I'm wanting energy. I want to pick me up. Thank God. Nowadays it's like meditation or something super healthy, but it's the tendency when you're tired or when you're sick and, and groggy is to want a quick fix, right? To give you that boost of energy. And, and we don't think of salad. <laughs> Don't think of right. chocolate and coffee and, you know, something crunchy and salty and creamy or whatever. So yeah, it's a real trap, isn't it? Absolutely. And, you know, I think of improving your sleep in three ways. First of all, you want to make sure you're getting enough hours of sleep. Then there's right timing. Are you a night person, a morning person? Neither. And then there's also sleep quality? Do you have an actual sleep disorder that is decreasing your sleep quality? And that first piece of how much sleep do you do best with, I think is a great place to start. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Our bodies are different. So I'm sure you see people having different needs along those lines. Absolutely. We fall on a bell curve. The bell curve centers around eight most adults need somewhere between seven to nine hours. And then a few people, 2% will maybe need six hours and 2% and will need 10. But most of us are somewhere in that seven to nine eight, uh, range. And the great thing to do is to figure out, okay, where do I fall on that bell curve? I personally am eight and a half hours. I don't know, Tricia, if you know, how much sleep do you do best with? I've improved over time, my sleep, sleep has definitely improved over time. And I used to be like a six, I used to, oh gosh, I mean, I used to be like a five hour girl and then I became a six hour girl. And now I think I'm a seven hour girl and I would love to get eight. I just can't quite see that happening, but I'm working on it, right? I'm trying to get better about my sleep. I go to bed generally around 10 and get up around six. For a long time, I had an aura ring. And it never mm. reported that I, if I was in bed for eight hours, it was not eight hours of sleep. Was my aura ring lying or is that really true? Like, it's like, there's a lot of waking up and it diminishes the hours, even though you think you're sleeping for a certain amount of time. We definitely have periods of wakefulness in the night. Um, you know, fairly common to have a few, uh, I don't know how much less your aura ring said, but it shouldn't be more than half an hour or 20 minutes that we're awake in the night. So a great exercise for people to do, there's a couple ways, two or three ways to figure out how much sleep you do best with. The first one is to think back to a time that you were really well rested and like cognitively snappy, well-coordinated on your fitness routine, emotionally even keel, able to make those good choices around food. Maybe you can remember and know how much you slept at that time. I can't, I, that I can't, I have no idea. You can't, no, no all idea. I know, yeah, all I know is I got rid of my aura ring because I didn't like being so hyper-focused on my sleep. It just, it almost yes. like had, it was counterproductive. So I'm like, I get what I get, but I do feel like I'm doing better. So I feel, I feel my best now, honestly. Good, good. 
So the other way that you can figure out is to know if you're waking up to an alarm, you have not gotten enough sleep. You're truncating your sleep. So you can do 10 days of scheduling yourself as much sleep as you can get and see how much sleep you get. I like to do 10 hours in bed, 10 days in a row to really get kind of sleep saturated. And hopefully if you're really sleep deprived, that was not going to be enough, but hopefully 10 days, 10 hours a night in bed and just see, you know, after that kind of catching up on your rest, where do you settle out? Are you eight? eight and a half, seven and a half or whatnot. I think that idea that when we are waking up to an alarm, we haven't gotten enough sleep is a really useful idea for people. And so how do people deal with that? I mean, I don't use an alarm because I'm on my own schedule by the grace of God. And and so I just, I, I wake up pretty naturally around six, 6.30, something, something like that. But how do people who have jobs or their kids get have to get to school, how do you do it without a, an alarm? Well, the other thing that you can do is if you are waking up with an alarm currently, you can go to bed 15 minutes earlier every three or four nights and just keep going to bed slightly earlier, slightly earlier, progressively earlier until you wake up before your alarm. That would be a good strategy. I love that. So if your body is waking up without an alarm, that's an indication that your body's rested? It should be much closer. Yes. I mean, there's also the timing issue. Are you sleeping at the right time for your body clock? I'm very strongly a morning person and I wake up before five on my own. And it doesn't matter if I go to bed at the right time to get my eight and a half hours, or if I stay up late, I will still be getting up by five. So, you know, if people have something like that going on, then they may be waking up on their own, but still sleep deprived. Now, do people have a a rhythm where some people are night owls and they do better that way and sleeping in the morning and vice versa like you? Yeah, absolutely. It's about a third of us in each category, being a night owl, more middle of the day, kind of neither or strongly a morning person. And we think that there's good reason for that uh, in terms of just human history and small tribes sleeping out on the tundra. You want to have somebody who's up and can put a log on the fire at all times of day. Okay, interesting. And so if you're somebody who is waking up with an alarm and that's like, they're like, that's just the way it's going to be. How do you recommend that they improve their sleep? Well, the other thing to keep in mind is your circadian system. We have this 24 hour rhythm in our function that helps us do more or less of our function at different times of day. We sleep at night, we're awake during the day, we digest much better in the day than we do at night because all of those cells in our digestion are programmed to be active during the day and more quiet in a rest state at night. So that circadian system is really cued by light and dark. And I'm sure that you and your listeners have heard about avoiding screens at night and that that's really just 10% of what we need to be doing to really bolster our circadian system. And if you have a strong high amplitude circadian system, it's going to help you sleep well. So during the day, you want to be getting outside. You want to be getting bright light, uh, 20 minutes of bright light in the first couple hours of the day. And then every two hours or so go outside and get bright light. We really need to have that, particularly on our eyes. It signals to the brain that it's daytime, time time to be in daytime, daytime physiological state. Then I know people have heard about not having screens at night. Lots of times when I talk with people one-on-one, they say, oh yeah, I heard that, but I didn't really think it could make that much of a difference. It actually makes a huge difference. The recommendation is that we actually spend the three hours before bed in low light, 10 lux. A lux is equal to one candle flame. So that's just 10 candle flames. That is a pretty dim room. 
Many of us are still in a pretty active part of our day, three hours before bed. So I think pretty much anybody who has electric light or screens should have some blue blockers. I like that you have props. What? Oh like yes, I love to have props. So <laughs> blue blockers really help signal to our brain that it's sunset. And when the brain gets that signal, it starts switching us into a physiological state where it's easy to fall asleep and it helps us feel drowsy. You should absolutely feel drowsy when you get into bed. So with blue blockers, you want to get these strong reddish colored lens. If you have some that are like this, which is just the yellow, that's not enough for this three hours before bed. You really need them to have this strong reddish orange color to the lens. I would try it because lots of times people say, wow, I had no idea what it would really feel like if I was drowsy at bedtime and what a difference it would make in my sleep. Absolutely. I love getting drowsy. I, like when the clock turns 10, I just, my eyes start to droop. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So, yeah, it's great. So the blue light blockers, three hours before you go to bed, what about television? Like I get, get off your computer, but what about watching TV? Cause I do like sometimes my guy and I will watch TV before we go to bed, not in bed, but like in the living room. Yes. So TV is also going to give that blue light that suppresses our melatonin. My college student, she teases me when I'm like, we're hanging out watching TV in the evening and I'm wearing my blue blockers and I'm like, yeah, well, who sleeps better? <laughs> and I sleep much better. Okay. But apparently I, I look a little dorky, but so what? <laughs> well, she would think that no matter what. <laughs> right. Okay. So great. And then for those of us, because this does happen to me on occasion, those of us who wake up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep, I go to the bathroom and then the minute I start thinking, I'm in trouble, like thinking about the day ahead or some project or some issue, then it's like I could be up for an hour. Any Absolutely. Yeah. So the blue blockers will help with that because your melatonin will be higher at night. Uh, so that's one benefit. The other thing is to really take to heart that sleep hours are kind of time out of time that you have your roles, your responsibilities, your to-do list, your thoughts, your planning, mental planning that you take care of during the day. And then you define sleep hours as time that you're done. You don't need to think about that stuff. And I know we're really trained and kind of conditioned in our culture, in our society to be like, go, go, go all the time. But that's not how humans have lived most of human history. And you don't have to live that way. You can say, okay, these eight hours or six or seven hours, I'm done. I did my best for those other hours, many more hours of the day, and now I'm done. And I have a freebie for people and it has a strategy of how to calm your mind. It's four steps and yeah, it works well. We need to share that with people. Can I just ask you, so what you're saying, and I love what you're saying, it's very good. Like don't get into work thinking. It's not time for work. It's just not time for work. It's not work time. Don't think about it. Of course, it's easier said than done, but action wise, that means that if I wake up and I'm laying in bed, I should not, I already know the answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> I should not get up and get on my computer and do work. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. No, <laughs> no. I like people to do kind of a brain dump process their day, make their to-do list, whatever kinds of thoughts come up in the middle of the night, take care of those an hour before bed. And then in the night, if your mind starts going, have a phrase, customize it to yourself. Something like, I already thought about that. I will have time tomorrow. Now is my time to rest. And it's really about establishing those boundaries in yourself, also with other people that like, you're not taking care of stuff in the middle of the night. I mean, of yeah. course, there may be times that you have an ill family member or you're on call for work or something, you have to take care of things, but our thoughts is, are not something we need to take care of in the night. I love that. 
Yeah. Sometimes I will meditate and boy, that's the best thing I can do because that just settles my mind down. But a book, like some kind of fiction or something just to, you know, think about nothing, so to speak, yes. is probably advisable. Right. A paper book, not Kindle, not on your computer. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's yeah. Fun. My preference for sure. Um, okay, great. Any other tips for people? Because I know you, like you spent a lot of time, as you said, before we started the interview, you were telling me that people just the basics of sleeping, and we have been talking about this, and I think it's so valuable. So thank you for bringing this information. Any other basics that you find yourself telling people over and over that just need to be said? Well, I would like to give a shout out for actually sleep disorders. There are 58 sleep disorders. And I know, fortunately, in the last just couple, two or three years, we're seeing a lot more information on social media about sleep skills. But if you have been doing your best with sleep skills, the things I've mentioned, the things, you, other things you've seen on social media, and you're just not getting traction, know that there are 58 sleep disorders. They are largely undiagnosed. And you may be kind of, you know, doing the best you can, but you can't solve a sleep disorder by getting enough time in bed. And so if you're in that state, I would encourage you to go to your primary care physician or a sleep center and say, I want an appointment that's just a focused only on sleep. And we do a full screening, you know, which could be the interview, the physical exam, and then a referral for a sleep study if necessary. And really, you know, make sure that you don't have a sleep disorder going on. Can you give us some examples of sleep disorders? Yeah. So one of the things I've been trying to raise awareness on, on is that women postmenopausally have a much higher rate of obstructive sleep apnea. That's where a person's breathing pauses for 10 seconds or more repeatedly in the night. Uh, that is very important as we lose estrogen, as we lose progesterone, those actually help our respiratory drive and the tone of our airway. So we're more prone to obstructive sleep apnea. Restless legs is another one that is more common in women and increases over the lifespan where people just feel like they have to move their legs usually in the evening and can interfere with falling asleep. Okay. Interesting. And the obstructive sleep apnea, is that the one that's weight or I mean, is the obstruction in part or could be in part because of overweight, like too much weight in your neck? Overweight contributes to it. It's not the only factor. There's also like, I have a small jaw and a little bit recessed and large tonsils. So although I'm overall pretty fit, I'm more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea just because of the shape of my airway. So there's also that. Interesting. Okay. So restless legs, obstructive sleep apnea. Can you name a couple other ones that you see a lot? Uh, well, there's some very interesting ones that come to mind that are more prevalent in women. One is sleep related eating disorder where people are eating in the middle of the night in their sleep. That's related to sleep walking and is more common in women who have a history of eating disorders. And there's also, of course, insomnia. We define insomnia if it's taking more than 30 minutes at the beginning of the night to fall asleep, or if you're awake for prolonged periods in the middle of the night. Okay, got it. I call it nighttime eating. I'm very familiar with it. And I have a lot of clients that do that or have done that in the past. Are the cases of that that you've seen, are they people who don't know they're doing it in the moment they're doing it? Yes. Like yes. it's literally That's... sleepwalk eating, like sleepwalking and eating. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And it is rare. It's quite hazardous because we don't have our judgment. And so people will eat things actually that aren't edible, which mm. is scary. Yeah. Yeah. Walking that back a step pardon the pun, but um, it would be, I guess, what I call nighttime eating, which is consciously getting up yeah. and eating, you know, and that can be driven obviously by emotions, by, you know, deeper psychological, like past events, subcon like events in your you know, buried sure. in your subconscious and that kind of thing. So interesting. 
cool. Will you tell us about the free gift that you have? Because I think this is so helpful for people. Yes. Yeah, so I have a little PDF sleep plan that guides you through creating a sleep healthy lifestyle because really bolstering your sleep starts in the morning. Like we talked about with the sunlight, it goes through that. It goes through some of the red flags of sleep disorders. And then it also has that, how to calm your racing mind four step strategy. So there's that. And I also have a webinar where I go through that. If people want that additional information. Beautiful. I love that. And we're going to put that in the show notes so you can grab that. That's a great gift. I hope everybody takes advantage of that in the show notes on on this show on our website. Yeah, great. I love it. I'm just taking a look at that. That is really cool. So thank you for that. And I have one last question for you, Catherine, this being the Heal Your Hunger show. What is your deepest hunger? Oh, my deepest hunger is to go skiing. (laughs) That is my deepest hunger. (laughs) <laughs> that's awesome. I didn't expect that. That's awesome. And so that's your favorite thing to do is to ski. It is absolutely my favorite thing. And where do you ski typically? I'm on the Pacific coast. So I like to go ski at Whistler. Okay. I've never been there. I used to live in Seattle actually oh. many, many moons ago. I love the Pacific Northwest. That's great. So you're a a ski person. That's beautiful. I like to ski as well, but I I wouldn't say it's my deepest hunger. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for all you do to help people have more restful sleep. Will you share your website with everybody? Yep. So my website is skilledsleeper.com. You can see my different courses for improving your sleep. And then I'm on social media, YouTube, Instagram at skilled sleeper. Great. And will you just mention the different, um, your courses are, are they're segmented for different audiences. Yes. Just mention that. Yeah. So people in different life stages and different life circumstances have different sleep challenges. And so my courses, I don't just have one generic sleep course. I really took the time to customize them for different people, uh, ones for families, ones for women. There's one for shift workers, for police, for corporate leaders. And it really allows us within a reasonable amount of time to go deep into the issues that those folks are most likely to face. I love that. That's awesome. So you guys go to skilledsleeper.com. I love it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Catherine, we're so glad that you're here. I'm really excited to air this so people can get better sleep. So thanks for taking the time on this holiday for coming to share your brilliance. I appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next show. If you're ready to get off the dieting roller coaster ride and finally make peace with food and with your body, talk to a Heal Your Hunger mentor about what steps you need to take based on your own history with food and weight. Go to healyourhunger.com and register for an emotional eating breakthrough session and see how fast you can experience real change. It's a complimentary evaluation, but there are limited spots available. So go to healyourhunger.com and register to speak with a mentor today.